Hey everybody, I'm uh, Dan. I'm an assistant professor at uh, UC San Diego. I just started uh, last week actually, and uh, uh, prior to that, and kind of the work that I'm gonna talk to you about is, uh, I, was at, I was at Stanford basically building secure systems, in particular uh, secure uh, web frameworks. Uh, and unlike you know every other Stanford grad student, I also have a startup that's commercializing kind of the stuff that we've been building there. Okay, so uh, to get started, I wanna just kind of look back at uh, an early bug that uh, Facebook had in, in their application. So Facebook missed a single security check in their Android application, and uh, this person happened to have found it. Uh, this particular uh, vulnerability allowed kind of any user to send a delete request to their HTTP uh, application and uh, basically delete anybody's uh, album, right? And, and anybody's uh, photo album. Now this is actually just a tip of the iceberg uh, over the last, uh, a year and a half, I've been talking to companies about uh, web application security, and the story is actually way worse, right? Like, I've heard stories where, say, an intern was building a particular feature and accidentally exposed, you know, the whole password uh, of every user for, say, 24 hours. Now, this didn't make the news, um, but in reality, like, the story, I think, is way worse than we kind of hear about in the news. And this is not because these companies don't know what they're doing. It's really because of the way we're building applications and systems in general, right? So what's, what's the actual problem, right? Well, uh, when we look at it, there are three things happening. The first one is that we are building these systems that inherently handle sensitive information, right? So they're handling our medical data, our now like IoT is handling our you know, thermostat and it's telling you whether or not you're in the house, uh, political data, banking, and so forth. And all these applications and systems are built using programming models that actually don't know about the sensitivity of this data, right? They don't know that this particular uh, information, which happens to be a social, a social security number, is actually sensitive, right? And when developers write these applications, they use these programming models, and naturally, as we all write software, they introduce bugs, right? Now, all these three things independently are not really a problem, right? But when combined, uh, well, we, huge, we, we typically have a pr pretty big privacy uh, risk. Uh, now, to give you an actual example, uh, I want to go through uh, a blogging application. This blogging application is actually based on a real production blog app. I removed uh, kind of hopefully old names from here, uh, but this is a real application, and the application basically at its core handles two things. Uh, the first one is uh, blog posts, and the second one is, say, uh, the users that are writing these particular blog posts. Now, this is what the data model looks like. So on one hand, we have blog posts, and there's, of course, some sensitive information. That information is the blog post itself, right? So if I'm currently working on a blog post, and it's still a draft, maybe it should not actually be publicly readable. And we have the user model, which contains some sensitive information, in particular contains, say, the password hashes and the email addresses. So we might want to make sure that you know, nobody can read password hashes and only say uh, the people that you're, you're collaborating with or only when you actually declare it that an email should be public uh, can it be read by somebody else. Okay, so this is some sensitive information and the, the simplest kind of data model I could come up with. Uh, let's look at a particular um, feature that we can implement for this uh, application and see how uh, this particular web app did. Uh, the thing that I wanna look at is just simply reading a post. So we're gonna read a blog post uh, which takes uh, an ID and returns the post data and author information. Right? So this is what the source code looked like at the uh, initial kind of stage of the application. Right? So there's this read function. Can you guys actually see the source or no? Okay. Um, so uh, what this read uh, uh, function was basically doing is given some say, HTTP request, it was calling the, the read function with a particular ID, which itself talked to the database by calling the find one function database basically fetched uh, a couple of rows uh, from the two different tables. The first one would be, say, uh, f from the post model would be the actual uh, table that represents the, the post information. The second one would be the, the author information, right? So we want to include, say, the, the email addresses of uh, Bob and Claire when we uh, reply back with the, with the post. Now, what was happening, this was pr primarily a client-side application. It was returning a JSON object. And this JSON object happened to also include password hashes. So this particular web app was leaking user passwords. They didn't actually know about this, but they found out they fixed the password uh, leaking problem. And the way they did it is by tweaking the read function and adding a few uh, lines of code. These lines of code basically look through the uh, uh, data model object and omit the field named password and anything else that might be sensitive. Now this is like one particular uh, place where we're fetching these particular objects, but you're doing this in eight different places, right? So they had to go in about eight different places to add this particular check that would omit the password from user objects. Okay, so this is what the code looked like uh, basically six months after they fixed 
uh, this particular bug. Um, now, this particular piece of code still has a vulnerability, and the vulnerability is that it's leaking drafts, right? So, uh, because again, we're just fetching information, uh, when we fetch information, we're not actually checking to see whether or not the particular thing that we're fetching is a draft or whether it has been published. So if you're an anonymous user, you can just request this particular post ID and you get back the draft. Okay, so they also noticed this, um, and they also fixed it in the same way they fixed the previous bug by sprinkling a bunch of checks to about eight different places. Right, so what if we wanna do something slightly more interesting, right? So this is a really simple blogging application. Uh, they don't even have actually support for collaborators, but suppose they added support for collaborators, and one thing you might wanna have is that users that collaborate on a post can see and edit the post, but if you're not collaborating on a post, you can't see it, right? Again, the way you do it is just sprinkling more checks. Um, and just to give you an idea of like what this would actually look like in their code base, well, here's a particular route that handles uh, the updating of user uh, profiles. Now, the code itself is huge, and it's, there's like so many annotations, it's actually super hard to follow. And all the red arrows are the security critical checks, right? So if you've missed any of these, now you have a vulnerability in your web application. And unfortunately, the way we're tackling this problem of uh, fixing vulnerabilities is by just finding and fixing these bugs and just patching our applications and hopefully teaching our developers that you know, they should be adding the right checks in the right places and you know, using libraries they trust and so on and so forth. But of course, this is actually not working. Right? Like, I think it's almost like a daily occurrence that we have somebody like, getting owned and actually like, our consumer data being leaked. So in order to actually address this, we actually have to change how we build software. We fundamentally have to change this. And, uh, the way we're gonna do this is by minimizing our trusted computing base, right? So if you look at your system today, you're basically trusting most of the code that you're actually running, right? This is on the left-hand side. Um, and on the, uh, the, the reason for it is if you have any bug, well, that bug could potentially be a vulnerability, right? So as inherently, we have to trust this code. And we wanna move to a world where you don't actually have to trust most code, right? Uh, I'd like to get to a point where we only have to trust, say, like one particular file, and then we can import all these libraries, and we could have our developers like write these application features and not have to trust that code to be secure, right? So if we have a bug in that part of the application, it doesn't actually matter. That might just be a UI bug, but it's not a security vulnerability. Now, this is, of course, the thing that kind of the security uh, community has been trying to do forever, and the question is, can we actually do this? <clears throat> I want to convince you in this talk that we can, um, at least for web applications. And hopefully like, I can like, shed some insight into how we can potentially tackle this for other kinds of systems. Uh, the way we're gonna do it for web applications is by leveraging the way people actually structure web applications. Right? So if you look at a web app, well, the, most of the functionality is actually revolving around persistent data. Right? So in our particular blog example, well, this application revolves around blog posts and user, uh, user uh, profiles. Right? So conceptually, uh, the thing that we care about are these particular blog posts, in particular the drafts, and these user profiles, right? So all we need to actually do is make sure that these posts and these user profiles aren't leaked or corrupted by the incorrect users. And the other thing that makes web applications kind of special is that developers already have a security policy in mind, right? You kind of already know when you're building this application who's uh, should be accessing any particular piece of information, right? Like we know, for example, that anybody can read a post that's been published. We can like write this policy in English, in an English sentence. And we know, for example, that Alice is allowed to read her draft, but nobody else is until it's actually public or published. And finally, we know that nobody should be allowed to actually read password hashes. And really, like when you look at security, like knowing the policy is really half the challenge. The only other thing, like once we have the policy, is knowing how to actually enforce this particular policy. This is what our Hales uh, framework does. Our Hales framework is just a Haskell web framework, and it's designed around two principles. One is to uh, specify policy in a self-contained, concise uh, manner, and do so in a way that's separate from your application logic, right? So you should be specifying your security policy away from your nasty UI code, and not have to sprinkle checks throughout your code base to ensure that this particular policy was actually enforced. We don't want to depend on developers adding the right checks in the right places. We just want you to specify the policy once and have it uh, be enforced on everything. Right, so we want a concise policy and we want to make sure, again, that this policy is always enforced, right? Like, you can't write a piece of code that gets to bypass this particular policy. What that means is that if we can enforce this policy on everything and we got the policy right, then you don't need to actually trust any particular piece of code, right? So our application, like TCB, the amount of code that we need to trust to be correct, really just comes down to the policy specification code. Um, okay, 
So how do we actually, uh, like what does Hails really look like and how do we actually build applications? Well, the first thing uh, that, that we've done is extended the MVC model with security policies, right? So today, most applications are structured in kind of the MVC model, even though it's a little bit ugly, I'm gonna pretend that this is what they actually do. So in the model, you would typically define, say, your, your data interface, right? So you define your schema and how you actually store data on, uh, on disk. And you define, say, a renderer uh, that would, say, take this data and give you back an HTML page or a JSON object and so forth. So this is commonly called a view. And finally, you have the controllers that tie everything in, right? So the controllers take user requests, they talk to the model, they then talk to the view and give you back a fully rendered uh, HTML page. Now in practice, this model is actually kind of ugly because you're sprinkling security checks throughout the controller and sometimes even view code. So uh, what, what we're trying to do is make uh, this model slightly cleaner and actually give security a first class uh, citizenship. And the way we're gonna do this is by tying in the policy with the data model, right? So again, like the thing that we care about is protecting your data. So when you're actually specifying it, like schema for your database, well, this is when you should be specifying the particular policy and how this data should be accessed, right? So when you're saying this is a blog, uh, blog object and it has these particular fields, well, you should also say who's allowed to read and write this particular blog. And finally, uh, we're gonna enforce this policy everywhere to make sure that whenever you, you do read something, this policy is enforced. Okay, but how do we actually specify policy? Well, policies are just Haskell functions from, say, rows to labels. In our actual implementation, we're using Mongo, so it's not actually a row, it's a more document, but I think the row concept is slightly simpler to th think about. So what are these labels? Well, these labels are just a concise way of saying who's allowed to read and write this particular piece of information. It's just basically a conjunction of these junctions of principles, right? So Alice or Bob, Alice and Bob, and so forth. So let's take a concrete example of how we would specify a policy for our blog post object. Well, this would be, again, a function from the post object itself, and then we want to have the readers and writers. Well, who's about to read the post? Well, this information is contained in the post itself, right? So if the post has been published, then anybody can read this. If the post hasn't been published, well, then let's look at who the authors are and use those authors in our uh, read field, right? So like only the authors that are actually collaborating on this post are allowed to read this particular post. But who's allowed to write this particular post? Well, we want to make sure that only the authors, so what do we do? We just look up this information in the post itself, right? So just get the authors, and this will tell you who's allowed to read, uh, to write this particular post. Um, now, this is a, a function, right? So, like, you can't actually use it, uh, and this is not what the thing that is actually instantiated, but when we read something from the database on the right-hand side, for example, when we read, say, the first, uh, first row, this row is uh, a blog post written by Alice, and it has not yet been... Uh, made public, right, so it's, it's, it's still a draft. Uh, now, when we apply this policy to this particular row, what do we get? Well, we get that the readers are Alice and the writers are Alice. For the second uh, row, uh, which is a post uh, that Bob and Claire are coll collaborating on, this has been made public. So when we actually instantiate the policy, when we read from the database, for example, we would get that the readers uh, will include everybody, so it's a public post, and writers are only Bob or Claire. Right, so you get a very simple way of specifying policy, and in a similar way we can do it, say, for uh, the different fields on the particular user profile. So let's look at a policy for user passwords. What does this look like? Well, again, it's just a function from the object itself, so from users to a set of readers and writers, our label. So who's allowed to read a password? Well, we're saying nobody. And who's allowed to actually write the password? Well, the particular user, so I should be able to change my password and maybe I should allow root to change my password as well. So the writers are, in this particular row, um, uh, Alice or uh, root. Okay, now the question comes down to, okay, we have these labels and we have these labels when they come out of the database, where do we actually enforce these restrictions on who's allowed to read and write? Well, it's not enough to just enforce these restrictions at the model boundary, right? This is a pretty common thinking that like when you read something from the database, this is when you should perform the checks and nowhere else. Well, this is not enough. And the reason it's not enough is because, say, the code that's rendering the particular post might actually be able to leak it if you don't enforce these restrictions everywhere. So that's the thing that we have to do. We have to enforce these label restrictions on all code once it leaves the database. Right, so like once your renderer actually leaks your particular draft, it should not be able to actually leak, uh, once it reads it, it should not be able to leak it to an arbitrary host. Right, the policy that comes with the particular post from the database should be enforced even once you have access to this particular data. 
And what this means is that we don't have to actually trust the renderer code, right? Like we know that the policy ensures that it can't leak it, so you can write this particular renderer however you want, right? It's not part of our TCB. Okay. Um, so now we know where we're enforcing these uh, policies and what these policies look like. How do we actually do the enforcement? Well, our whole system is, is built around um, this technique called information flow control. Have any of you heard of this term before? All right, so very few. Uh, the idea is actually super simple. So uh, the idea behind uh, dynamic information flow control, at least in this particular context, is that whenever data leaves, say, your data model, it's explicitly labeled, right? So we apply the policy, and now we have basically an object that also has an associated label that says who's allowed to read and write this data. Uh, now, this particular label always follows data throughout the system. And finally, the mechanism, the underlying runtime system, enforces that these label restrictions um, are actually obeyed by whenever you're about to perform some kind of like network communication or write to the database or write to the file system and so forth. So going back to our example of reading a particular blog post, let's say we have our get request that is to read uh, blog post zero. Well, in our view uh, and controller code, we're gonna, again, just call into the database, right? So find one, give an index zero, this is gonna look it up by calling into the, the, the model and policy. The model and policy is gonna fetch the particular information from the database, right? So we're gonna have a row that uh, is the Alice's blog post. This blog post has not yet been published, so the policy that comes with it is that Alice is allowed to read it and only Alice is allowed to write it. Now, the model policy replies back to the view controller, so we get back this row, but this row has a label attached with it. So if we say, had a request incoming, uh, coming from Eve, well, at the particular boundary, we would check who uh, is Eve allowed to read this particular information. Um, and the policy says that uh, only Alice is, so we're gonna disallow this particular write. On the other hand, if Alice was the one performing the request, well, this would naturally be completely allowed. Okay, so when we step back, and I'm gonna go a little bit more into detail on how we actually do this and why Haskell is an interesting uh, language to do information flow control. But to complete the picture, I wanna uh, talk about the kind of application or architecture that comes out of uh, doing this model policy and view controller uh, separation. Right, so like our new paradigm has two kinds of code. On the one side, we have the model and policy. This is where you keep defining your data model as you typically uh, have done, but you additionally, um, specify policies, right? These policies are functions from rows to labels, and this is the piece of code that you need to get right, right? So if you specify a policy that is too permissive, you now have a vulnerability, right? So you need to make sure you get your policy right. But importantly, you don't actually need to care about the rest of the code base, and that's the views and controllers, right? This is a code that implements all the UI and handles all the user requests, right? So this is the code that we don't need to trust at all to get to, to enforce any security policy. You might still wanna have some policy code in the viewing controller to actually reply back to the user with, say, a meaningful error message, but importantly, you don't have to actually do that. And from this particular architecture, uh, we also get extensibility, right? So information flow control, which I'm gonna go into a bit more uh, in a bit, uh, gives us uh, the guarantee that, this, say, the, the viewing controller code can't actually leak your data, right? So that means bugs in the viewing controllers are not security vulnerabilities. So what that further means is that now you can have third-party developers implementing these views and controllers, right? So you might have started out with an application that has, say, your uh, standard view and controller that uh, you, you've implemented yourself, but now you can extend your application to third-party authors who might wanna, say, implement a mobile view and controller that interfaces with the same model and policy. And now you don't have to trust this piece, particular piece of code because the information flow control system ensures that whatever policy you've associated with the data is actually enforced regardless of who wrote the actual view and controller code. Now, using this model, we built a bunch of applications. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them. The first one is called Gitstar. And Gitstar was basically a GitHub clone uh, that let you modify the web app, the, the core web app features uh, yourself as a user of this particular platform. So say you didn't like the notification system, well, screw it, clone our notification system, modify it however you want, and then just deploy it on our platform. Uh, another thing that we built uh, was a, a, a commenting system similar to Discuss. This was actually built by a high school student who also worked on this uh, task management uh, system. So this particular student is awesome, um, but I think like, it also highlights that you know, Haskell is a language that you can use even if you're un unexperienced if you're given the right primitives. And finally, we built things like uh, conference review systems were coming from the academic world and uh, a blogging system. So let me show you this particular blogging system that was similar to if you've heard of uh, School of Haskell that will let you execute arbitrary code. Uh, 
um, server side to actually like have say interactive blog posts. Uh, the particular part that I want to show you is uh, just a um, uh, the, the post views. Uh, so on the right hand side here, so we, here we have basically like, you know your standard list of old posts. Then we have say Alice's particular post. So she has two posts. One is public. One is private. And here I've opened a private one. So, we're, and here I'm also logged in as uh, kind of the, the anonymous user, right? So I'm not logged in at all, and I can read all this information. And the reason for it is because I've set a bad policy. Now, this is the default when you start with a system that's not Hales, and normally you'd have to go through like at least the, these three different places to make sure that you know the current user that's making a request is allowed to read this particular data. In Hales, all we would have to do is change this particular policy to actually be correct. So, um, this is the policy for uh, blog posts, and I'm going to kind of just explain to you in detail. Uh, what the policy actually says. Can you guys see the, the code in the back? Yes, no? Okay. So maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger. All right. So it's actually pretty hard to work from this angle. Okay. So uh, the policy contains different fields. The, the, the first one is who's allowed to read and write uh, this particular database itself, where we're saying anybody is actually allowed to have access to this. And the kind of data that we can store here can be maximally sensitive. So like Hales also has the support to like just not let you save overly sensitive data to the database if you're paranoid about things like cover channels. But this is the, the, the interesting policy about blog posts. So we're saying the blog post is a document, and then these are the particular readers and writers for this particular document. Well, again, who's allowed to read this document? Well, if the post is public, then anybody. Um, otherwise, anybody. So this is where the bug is. So instead of just le letting anybody read the particular blog post uh, when, when it is uh, a draft, we should just say the collaborators, right? So in this case, I have collabs. Um, and this is basically grabbing the collaborators from the document itself. And finally, to kind of explain to you what the, the, these other fields are, well, they're basically telling the, the Hale system that this is how we want to index and actually find particular objects in the database. So now with this new policy, I'm gonna just recompile. And basically, once it's ready, just refresh the pages to show the filtering in action. I need a better laptop. All right, so the app is running, and now, again, as an anonymous user, I refresh the page, should no longer be able to actually see Alice's private post when I try to access the post itself, so I know that like we are leaking that a post exists, so I might have the actual post ID itself, but when I now try to access it, well, Hales will tell me that it's not found. And this is actually important as opposed to telling you that you're not allowed to access it because sometimes you might not want to tell people that post exists. And finally, of course, the last view is the one that has all everybody's posts. So I had one post and I always had one private post, but now we only see the public ones. Okay. All right, great. So um, that's what the, the system looks like in practice. When you look at the actual um, applications, we wanted to see like what does the TCB actually look like. So we're making the claim that you can write systems that are secure by actually considering most code untrusted. Well, how much of your code is actually trusted? Right. So if you look at the applications that we built, in particular the Git Star uh, uh, platform that uh, is a clone of GitHub. Well, we had to write one particular model and policy, right? This declared, say, uh, project, it declared collaborators, it declared uh, uh, get uh, access controls and so forth, and the total amount of code that we had to write for the policy was about 250 lines of code. Now, the, the rest of the application, if you look at the different uh, features, say like the, the project manager or the code viewer or even the wiki, this all added up to a total of around 200,000 lines of code. And this is all code that we don't actually have to trust nor care about. And a bunch of it is code that we just pulled out from Hackage, right? So now Hackage is slightly more, uh, more secure as a package manager because at least you can't overwrite somebody's package. But at the time we were building this system, that was not the case. And in particular, we didn't actually have to care about that. We could just pull packages from anywhere because we can guarantee that this third-party code can't leak your data. And for the other applications, which are like, uh, I guess, uh, they're, they're simple applications, but nevertheless, they actually like implement uh, real functionality that kind of companies do. Uh, and these, again, are you know, sublinear when, consider, uh, when compared to the actual application functionality itself. Okay, so 
we have a small TCB, like how do we actually implement this? Well, and like what exactly is Hales? Well, Hales is just a Haskell library, and it consists of a few components. Uh, the first one is an HTTP server and client so that your web app can actually handle a request and it can talk to a remote host. Of course, it has the database layer, and we have kind of nice DSLs for uh, actually handling routing and specifying policies. Now, the, maybe the most interesting component is uh, what the runtime uh, provides, and that's one, like user authentication, and two, the enforcement system itself. So the enforcement system is an information flow control system, uh, and it's called LIO. So this is kind of like what you're, uh, when, when you're deploying Hails, what it would actually look like. So you'd have your app functionality, whatever libraries that you might pull in, and your policy code, which is, again, trusted, and finally, like our LIO and um, Hails framework that are mostly uh, trusted themselves. So those are on the order of like 8,000 lines of code, but they're code for which we actually have some semantic guarantees. Now, you might be asking, why Haskell? So, uh, and the reason for it is, well, we're trying to do this pretty intense uh, enforcement mechanism, right? So we have dynamic information flow control, and it's really hard in general to design systems that don't inherently leak data, right? So the, the programming language community has been building these dynamic information flow control systems for like at least a decade, and most, if not all, have at least uh, the ability to like leak uh, data by just not terminating a program. And right, like we can't actually have that if we're trying to deploy real systems and uh, real uh, web servers, uh, for example, can't actually just stop the world when you're detecting that something uh, might be trying to leak information. All uh, right, so like things like concurrency, uh, exceptions, and even the ability to inspect security violations have been really hard to deal with. And Haskell actually makes this easy, and the way it, it, it makes it easy for us to handle this is by letting us define a sub-language uh, within the ecosystem. And like you can think of LIO as an information flow control secure kind of sub-language within Haskell. And finally, right, like Haskell is fast, and uh, at least part of it is amenable to formal re reasoning, so uh, we, we hope that like once we actually have the sub-language, well, we can actually make it fast enough, and we can actually prove something about it, and this did actually happen. Now, what do I mean by uh, sub-language? Well, uh, if, if, if you think about Haskell, right, Haskell is a purely functional uh, language. Uh, so what is a purely functional um, uh, language? Well, the first thing that uh, it gives us is we have functions that can perform any side effects, right? So say my render post function, which will take a post object and convert it to HTML, for example, can't actually have a function or like a call to something called like leak to evil server and the reason it can't do that, because leaking to an evil server might require secret communication to the network, this is side affecting, right? So we can't actually allow this. So this would not be part of a, a, a pure function. And that's, that, that's great, right? Like once we have pure functions, what does that mean? Well, it means we can't actually leak data by using pure functions. So we can already use a subset of Haskell immediately to like write code. Uh, now, we do need to talk to the world, and uh, in order to talk to the world, you have to use this thing called the IO monad. <clears throat> Now, how many of you have heard of the IO monad? Ah, right, so the audience knows already. Okay, well, just, I guess, as a, a, a recap for those who don't, well, the IO monad is just a way of encoding side effect in code. Right, so here I have um, a function called leak to evil server that I had in the previous post, the previous slide, I mean, <clears throat> that takes a post and basically leaks it to a server. And the way it does this is by using the IO monad, and it uses a few a uh, few things called actions, right? So first it would do, say, open connection, then it would actually say convert my post to a string, and then send the string to the server, and finally close the connection to the server. Now this is all made up, but the thing to take away is that the IO monad basically gives you a way to write imperative code in Haskell. Now the interesting thing about this is um, that this is just uh, declaring that you wanna execute and leak this particular post. In order to actually execute something, your IO actions have to be bound from the main uh, symbol, right? So you actually have to say somewhere that you want to run this particular action. Um, and the second interesting thing is that, well, the Haskell type system forces you to reflect the fact that you're performing something side affecting in the type of the thing that you're describing, right? So in this case, we have to say that leak to evil server actually has type IO unit, so it doesn't return anything, but it's something that performs I.O., right? And, and what's really important is that the system doesn't actually have a way of taking something that's I.O. something and just converting it to that something. So there's no function that goes from I.O. A to A, and this, right, like would completely let you bypass the type system and do all kinds of unsafe things. Okay, well, so we have pure Haskell, and we know that we can control 
um, you know, the, the IO actions that we want to execute. So to get security, well, just don't execute any IO actions, right? This is awesome. We have 100% security and, you know, can't do much. So how do we actually do something useful? Uh, well, we define our own custom monad, right? And this is the LIO monad, uh, which stands for labeled IO. So LIO is just a wrapper around the IO monad, but it does one additional thing. And this thing that it does is it associates a current label with IO computations, right? So this type that I'm declaring here, uh, LIO A, is just a function from an IRF, which is just a global variable of a label to the actual uh, IO computation that we're gonna perform. And we're gonna expose two different things in this IO monad. So this, uh, in, in defining our monad, we're kind of declaring our language, right? And our language for now contains two things. That one thing is get label, so that will just tell us what the current label is. And then raise label, which takes a label and performs an action. And the action that it performs is, it basically just changes the underlying label that is associated with the IO computation. Now the point of this, this, this label, uh, which again just uh, encodes to readers and writers, it's to reflect what we've read so far in this particular computation. Right, so the label keeps track of what you've read, and when we define new primitives, well, we can use this label to restrict where you're actually allowed to perform writes. So let's like actually look at that. So suppose we want to extend our LIO uh, language. Um, well, okay, sorry, before I actually get into that, uh, one thing that I do want to point out is this LIO TCB. Uh, so it's really important for you to not actually export this, and we use abstraction and, and safe Haskell to do that. Because if you can just get at this particular symbol, right, like that will let you uh, execute arbitrary IO actions and make them look like LIO actions. So we really don't want you to do that because that would defeat the whole point of this whole system. Okay, so uh, back to actually looking at uh, how we restrict reads and writes and how we enforce information flow control. Well, whenever you're performing, uh, say, an action that would read something, what do we do? Well, in this case, I have, say, reading a reference. Uh, we basically look at the reference of that thing. So in this case, it would be L, and we raise the current label to reflect that we're reading something this sensitive. So that's what raise label does, and then it actually performs the real read reference, right? So now our new label, when we perform read LIRF, will include the fact that we read this particular reference. And importantly, when you actually are performing writes, we wanna make sure that you can only write to places that would not leak information. All right, so when we say we want to write to a reference, well, what do we do? We get the current label. This label, again, is a history of what we've read, and we want to make sure that this label can actually flow to the label of the thing that we're trying to write to. Right, so you can only write to things that would respect this particular label, and this is what this can flow to function does. And if you're not allowed to perform this particular write, well, we just fail and throw an exception. Okay, so uh, stepping back, uh, what is the LIO sublanguage? Well, it's a standard library that actually wraps most of the Haskell IO library, and we have things like exceptions, threads, references, file systems, and so forth, but they additionally, like all these functions, perform a label check before actually performing the IO underlying action. So you can think of LIO as, as a sublanguage that gives you security, and the sublanguage consists of two parts. One is the standard library, and two is pure Haskell, right? So we can use pure Haskell to, uh, and uh, the LIO monad to write our whole kind of uh, VC and MP uh, computations, right? So any program written in, uh, in this particular uh, sublanguage can be considered untrusted, right? Because we make sure that information flow control is actually enforced whenever we perform any individual actions. And importantly, the type system is a thing that actually restricts us, uh, that allows us to restrict uh, these untrusted computations to the LIO monad, LIO monad. Okay, so what do we get with this? Well. Two things, first is LIO computations are guaranteed to preserve confidentiality and integrity, right? So we can make sure that you don't leak your data and you don't corrupt your data. And uh, we have formal semantics for this, for this, so I hope you trust that that's actually true despite like the hopelessness that Adam uh, was talking about earlier. Um, and two, um, by writing code in LIO, um, well, you effectively have a program that's secure by construction, right? So uh, if you don't use any of the unsafe parts of the LIO, system like the TCB stuff, um, um, which you actually need when you're extending LIO, then we actually have a guarantee that this will, this, that the security guarantee will keep going. Now, there, of course, is a, a gotcha, right? And that's that you have to set good labels, right? So if the label is too permissive, then you have a vulnerability. And in general, setting labels has been a pretty hard topic in the information flow control community, uh, but one that we've actually managed to start tackling. So the whole MPVC model that I talked about earlier that Hales provides, 
uh, is a way to simplify policy specification and setting labels in a way that's automatic uh, and doesn't actually have to deal with these particular low level details. Uh, but it seems like we can actually generalize this to other kinds of systems. We've looked at uh, a, f a few in the domain of client side applications and uh, some other people have looked at say IoT and so forth and it seems like if you're actually looking at how to structure your applications in a way where you can uh, specify policies on data then you can use something like LIO underneath to actually protect this data. Okay, so to summarize, I think we can actually build secure systems, um, but we have to do so in a way that considers most code untrusted, right? If, if most code is untrusted, then that means that bugs in this particular code won't be security vulnerabilities, and we don't actually have to convince our developers uh, in the futile attempt of actually writing bug-free code. And the approach to do this is, well, to separate your policy and your security code from your, the rest of your application um, and make sure that this policy is actually enforced everywhere. So I guess, uh, thanks, and feel free to contact me and uh, try out LIO or Hales, and we're working on some new stuff, so be happy to talk and answer any questions now. Uh, it's, right, so it, it, is the approach embeddable in other frameworks? Uh, the answer is yes. So we implemented Hales kind of with, with the whole premise of actually wanting to build platforms like Facebook where you have deliberately un, like third-party code. Um, but the whole um, model of just the MPVC approach actually works elsewhere, so you can absolutely use that. But you still need something like LIO to actually enforce um, the, the, the policies that you're specifying. And in fact, uh, one of the projects uh, on, the, on a previous slide, Elmonad, is doing exactly that. Yeah. So you all have a little bit more. Can you take the, the component of Hales that you can't build by restricting read and write access into an existing Y app with a different router than Hales has? Um, so uh, the question is, can you take the basically the information flow control mechanism that restricts the read and writes and tie it in with other routing frameworks? Uh, yeah, yeah, totally, okay. uh, absolutely, right. So like one, one thing like you can just do is say use the LIO system by itself and uh, run it in your, in your framework. So whenever you have a controller, you can say this controller will now execute an LIO action and I'm gonna specify policies somewhere else that will make sure that when I execute the controller, those policies are actually enforced. All right, any other questions? Cool, thanks.